of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat, and with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way, I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other world. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Hello and welcome everybody. I am your host for tonight, Justin James Garcia, son of Zen Garcia, and I'm joined by a special guest, author and researcher Gary Wayne, the author of Genesis 6 Conspiracy Parts 1 and 2. Really excited to continue our Ask Me Anything series. If this is your first time joining us for an Ask Me Anything series, we do have a pre-made list of questions that are rollovers from last month, and we do this monthly. If we get through all of these questions, we will be taking down the live stream chat questions over here at youtube.com slash Zen Garcia. And I am taking note of all those questions that everyone is asking. Shalom to Donna, Adrian, Andrew, Meow M, Danielle, uh, Tree Mistress, Living, Christ Fisherman, Shay, Zach. Uh, really good to see all of you. And I do have your questions already, Daniel and Andrew. I will add those to the list. If we don't get to them tonight, which prayerfully we will, we will roll them over to next month's Ask Me Anything as the pre-made list. So shalom, everyone. Really good to see you all. And uh, without further ado, let's bring on our guest. Brother Gary, are you with us? I am, and uh, so excited to be back. So looking forward to the show. Yeah, me too. We have some really great questions, as always. And definitely uh, encourage everyone, please do write your questions there in the chat. And yeah, shalom. It's really good to see everyone. Uh, prayerfully you've all had a blessed month how was your month brother gary any updates on part two the release yeah so very busy month and so the uh, typeset edit has been done which means it's done in the format of the book and so it's going to look exactly like uh, the other book in terms of the size and the print level because i know people like the uh, print level size of it and it'll have the new seal uh, on each of the chapters, just as there's a different seal that's on the front cover. So uh, that's all done. And so uh, now it goes, it's in the publishing queue, but I'm trying to get an update. Usually when we're at this point, it's probably maybe 30 days away, but I've been told not to get too excited yet because there's uh, some problems in the publishing industry as we speak. <laughs> So no definite date. So there's a shortage of paper. There is a shortage of printers and there's a shortage of labor. And what's going on with the printers apparently is, is all of the large publishers have bought up the smaller printers. So that's created a bottleneck and a shortage and it's driven up uh, publishing costs to 40%. So whatever COVID was doing to add, and the inflation and the spending was doing to add to inflation. You just got this sort of continual driver. So not an assured date. Uh, I'm thinking if it's not uh, sort of nailed down pretty quick, it probably doesn't come out before Christmas, but I don't know that for sure yet. It's just a matter of uh, getting a firm date and everything nailed down. And then you have to, what you have to do is you have to give Amazon these days a firm release date. And if you miss that release date, then they punish not just the author, but they punish the publisher. So uh, there's probably going to be two things. There's going to be two kind of release dates, if I can put it that way. One, so that there's no issues with it, Amazon, and then to have it come out sooner. And I've already asked that I can sell the book if it's ready before what that official release date is. And that has, has been, I have been told yes on that. So once I get those final details out, I will get uh, back to everybody and all the emails that were sent to me in terms of notification as to when and how you can pre-buy the book. Uh, and uh, 
so I'll be doing that over the next two to three weeks and that that will all be out once I have that final piece of information. I will say this is working on the website as well. We have book two or or Genesis six conspiracy part two uh, going up on the website. So there's already a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters that's on the website. I haven't reviewed it yet. I was supposed to do that today. There is an ability to purchase the book, but it's not available yet. So, uh, but if you're interested in the table of contents and a little bit about what's in some of the chapters, that's up there and some interesting pictures to go with it. And then we're working on getting up the bundling pricing and everything like that. So, uh, so working on it still hard, but I, I just don't have that firm date for you guys at this point. That's really exciting. I'm definitely going to head over to Genesis6Conspiracy.com and check out the table of contents. That's one of my favorite parts when I'm window shopping for books is just to breeze through that table of contents. You know, you can tell a lot about a book just by going there. So hopefully you get a lot of traffic over there. And did I hear you right? You're taking pre-orders? Yes, I will be. Uh, If you do place the order now, I mean, I would hesitate until I give you the exact information, but if you do do it, I will keep it and I will ship it in order as the uh, orders come in. So I will print them and send them out as soon as I get uh, books myself. So, and uh, I think you're right on the table of contents. I mean, I, I, you know, in the first book, I think my table of contents just sort of grabs people's eyes if they go through it and they're going, maybe I should have a look at that as a Christian. <laughs> When you look through this table of contents, you're going to say, I need I need to dig into some of this, whether or not I buy his book or not, because there's way too much going on in the Bible I don't know about. Yeah, that's awesome. I definitely I think that you've been down a lot of rabbit trails that most mainstream Christians and even seasoned uh, rabbit trail connoisseurs have not gone through and not explored. So really appreciate your research. As always, thank you for joining us. For this Ask Me Anything, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the questions for tonight. And once again, just to encourage everyone, do check out Genesis6Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis with the number 6Conspiracy.com. And you can find a lot of free resources there. Uh, all those excerpts of those chapters, that's very generous. And I know the, the publishing has been crazy lately uh you know we do operate sacred word publishing and all the printing costs everything has just gone gone haywire so we praise god that you have been able to publish your book in this time and uh, prayerfully it will be released soon and all of that will work out and people will be able to get their hands on all of your research but all right let's go ahead and jump over into the first question that comes from the matrix squared Have you been keeping up with the recent astrological developments that Stellarium predicts with which will occur later this month, such as with the asteroid named Child? If so, what is your take? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that are going on these days and uh, expect more of this type of technology. So I'm sure some people probably aren't familiar with Stellarium. And uh, there, are, I think there there are some competitive formats out there as well. But what it is is basically software and star maps, and it's available on the website, and you can get uh, an app for it, and you can see the astrological events that are that are coming. And so, anything to do with science, start to look at it with a hard analytical analytical eye so that you get a better understanding of who controls this world, including the sciences and the things that they're going to use with this kind of technology and advancing technology down the road. And you're going to see this this type of uh, web format. I think, just my speculation, I think this type is is what's going to help stir a lot of the fear as we get further on in the end times. So although science can be used for good and evil, knowledge can be used for good and evil, uh, expect that this is going to be stirring the pot, so to speak, um, even though there's probably going to be some good information in there. And as Matrix Squared has has suggested, there are 
many meteors that are expected coming from uh, space uh, in uh, in October. And so they're coming from, and, and these meteors are called draconids or draconids, I mean. So basically from the, the root word dragon and draconta out of Greek and draconta is a watcher. And these meteors are coming, if, and I'm not sure whether a child is uh, one of those ones that's in there, but the ones that they're tracking for October and expected to have on the 11th um, is coming from the constellation Draco, <laughs> again, for the dragon. So if you're not familiar with dragon in the Bible, uh, it obviously has a relationship with Satan in Revelation 12, who's known as the serpent and the dragon and the devil. And so you get that sort of instantaneous uh, understanding, just as a Leviathan is also thought of as a dragon and also angelic beings like seraphim. And some people might even consider cherubim as a form of dragon as well. So these are watcher angels. And so we're going to see these meteor showers, but I would expect that this is going to be something that we're going to see more of. And, and you see now with the media, anytime there's something about a comet or, uh, you know, a an eclipse or an unusual event, they give it super hype. That's part of the building process and preparation because there's going to be signs in the end time. I don't think that this is a significant sign, at least at first blush. Um, but certainly when we look at the sorrows and then we add in what uh, Luke and Mark are talking about into the sorrows, we get signs in the sky, signs in the moon, signs in the sun, signs in the stars, and the seas are going to rage. And Mark 13, 22, Luke 21, 25. So we're going to see these kinds of things. And then we're also going to see uh, that are designed to scare people. And we're also going to see the contrived signs. So just as uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, um, and the false prophets in Mark 13, 22, they're going to cause signs that they're going to take credit for or predict or both. And so we need to be really on our toes as they start to inundate us with this kind of information. So now what's also interesting is, is that, you know, a star is understood as an angel as well. And Draconis, the constellation Draconis is very popular in parts of the alien mythos and vampire mythos of the return of beings. Sometimes they're like demigod-like vampire beings, which understanding that Draco is kind of the root word for Dracula. Um, and uh, vampire is an allegory for the patriarchal bloodline and the blood drinking of Nephilim to have immortality and then the natural enemies of humankind. So there's a connection there. And also with the stars returning uh, to the earth, uh, although these are meteors, they're also kind of sometimes referred to as, as stars, even though it's kind of a bad analogy in terms of, of how that's referred to. But they could be being depicted to us on this line of thought as just being meteors, but we could be seeing stars falling to the earth and getting ready in great numbers for the end time. So, and if Antichrist is going to be recreated um, and born in more of a recent period as opposed to already being here with the understanding that we're in the fig tree generation, uh, then I think that we are, that Jesus talks about in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that in one generation, all of these signs that he predict, predicts are going to be fulfilled in that one generation. So either Antichrist would likely be alive right now, or this is one of those things where you have science emerging with occult 
religions with an announcement for a Messiah. And you've probably, people have heard of a whole bunch of other things with Revelation 12 and things that are associated from the occult perspective, uh, not only with astrology, astronomy, but also with the coming and birth of Antichrist. So it could be from their ritual perspective where they name everything after their gods, their genealogies, their history. Uh, and, and I can't, you know, underline it any more than, you know, the Draconis constellation or Draco constellation and the Draconids are these meteors that are coming from that constellation. They just, they just tend to hide everything in plain sight because they know we're not ready to look for it. But in terms of one asteroid being named child, that is being done by people who are having their strings pulled and they're going to name those things after things important to the visible ones controlling the earth and the invisible ones who the visible ones answer to um, after that history that, that I just talked about. So I don't think there's anything significant to this. I, I could be wrong, but I think it's just part of the ramping up of the signs. Well, very interesting information. Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question comes from MJM. During the very early days of Atlantis and before, did God have a Tartarus or prison for the fallen angels, or did this prison happen after Adam and Eve came into existence? It's a it's a it's a very very good question. And is there more than one Tartarus? Is another question that wasn't asked, but it's, it's sort of relevant to the question that MJM has asked. So the abyss is created for the major crimes that fallen angels, and in before the flood, it would be the parent gods versus the offspring gods after the flood. So gods like Kronos in Greek mythology before the flood, offspring gods like Zeus after the flood, El parent god in Canaan, Baal offspring god after the flood, and the one who runs the assembly on Mount Hermon with the Baalim. So understanding that is that had the angels known about this prison, that is talked about in first Enoch and other books of Enoch and other Apocrypha. This is a place of fire and ice where they're chained and hung and they're tortured in a, uh, a way that is most unpleasant. And uh, they, you know, they're wanting to be freed and they're wanting Enoch to um, intervene once they go to the prison. So, my my thought is is that a number of the angels probably wouldn't have done these types of crimes had they known about the abyss, or if they had known about the uh, the resurrection, they probably wouldn't have done that either. Uh, as another instance, so I think the abyss is created within something that was created before. So when we get that term hell in the Bible, we get several terms that are conflated with it. Uh, you know, terms like the lake of fire and the abyss Tartarus is not the um, lake of fire. Tartarus is a prison, uh, an abyss prison, a pit prison, as it's known in, 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 in the Bible. And so that is something that is completely different than the abyss prison and is somewhere else and is reserved for the devils and the false prophet and uh, the fallen angels and Satan and uh, all those who take the mark of the beast. It's also used for the second death, but those in the first groups are going to be punished for forever for, for the size of their crimes. So if we understand then that the abyss prison, the pit prison, Tartarus, is in Hades, or Sheol, as it's called in, in Hebrew, it's a different location within this dimension that's within the earth. So it takes the same position, but it's on kind of a different wavelength, so to speak, and requires portals to get access to it. Now, this word Tartarus, um, we don't see that in the English translation, particularly you know out of the King James Version, but what we do get is that conflated word Hell in 2 Peter 2 4. And that's uh, G5 
5020, and that's Tartarus, meaning hell. And as it's understood as coming out of the Greek language um, and defined in Strong's, it's a dark place uh, in the earth, in subterranean earth, and it's a place of punishment. It's a prison. So this is very much the pit prison that the Old Testament talks about, or the pit that's talked about in the King James Version in in Revelation 9, and the abyss prison in in some of the more modern translations. So I think that this prison was made after uh, the uh, rebellion and after the creation of the giants. So I think probably at that time frame, or it may have been, created before and hidden and then moved into place once the crimes were were committed with creating the Nephilim. Now, Tartarus is also connected to the giant rebellion in Greek mythology, and that at a point in time, they rebel against the gods as well, and they're going to send these giants to Tartarus. And they actually send some of the other kinds of creatures that are created between the gods that are different than the Nephilim, they're going to go to Tartarus as well. And this is the place in polytheism that the giants escape out of and show up after the flood from a Greek mythology and history perspective. So this is like a counterfeit Tartarus for this uh, specific prison for physical giants versus the giants, the Nephilim, the Raphaim, the terrible ones that are talked about in Ezekiel 32 that are locked in the sides of the abyss, also mentioned in Isaiah 14. Uh, That's the actual abyss, and nobody escapes out of there. So this Tartarus is a counterfeit. And so... I think when you're reading about Tartarus, you have to understand and separate what the Greek mythology is talking about or a version of it in other accounts, but understand that there are, there is one that only God has the key for, and he provides it to an angel in the end time to unlock that prison. And it will not be unlocked until then, which makes either Uh, the Tartarus of uh, Greek mythology, uh, a complete counterfeit or a corruption of of the biblical understanding. So, uh, but to answer MGM's question, I think that uh, God reveals things as it's required to be revealed as he lets the, uh, as he lets the fallen angels through free choice and free will to continue to convict themselves things are continued to be stepped up and there's thresholds if they cross they go into this prison and i don't think they would have known about it beforehand otherwise they probably from my perspective they wouldn't have risked going into that now some people might come back and say well the fallen angels if they created giants after the flood which is my favorite position um, they would know they would still be going to the same place I think what they the reason why uh, the angels after the flood not only create the giants again and are going to do this anyways they do it out of spite uh, this is a very hateful thing that they're doing against God and against humans to create the giants again after the flood because they want to wipe humankind from the face of the earth. It's the only way that they're going to save themselves and save their brethren that are in the abyss. So I think the spite and the hate goes up several notches and you get a small group of those watchers that are going to do this again. And not all the angels are in the abyss prison. So understand that there's a lot of angels and only the worst of the fallen angels are in the pit prison. Oh, really great information. Thank you very much for that one. And next question comes from Donna Smith. Where did evil come from? How did Lucifer know how to have pride in his heart? Yeah, it's a really good question. It sort of goes back to uh, one of the things that um, I mentioned in the answer to the last question is that uh, God allows all sentient beings by free choice to choose him or not. 
difference. The difference between humans and angels is, is they had intimate knowledge of God. They didn't know everything about God, but they had intimate knowledge, intimate interaction. And we have little knowledge at this point with not as much interaction as obviously we would like for a period of time. And both have to choose God through free choice. Our choice is more difficult because they were created immortal and will remain immortal, even though they go to the lake of the abyss, which is one of the reasons why you know they're going to be there forever. And we have to choose immortality by choosing Jesus and choosing God so that we can be resurrected up to be like angels. So with that as a sort of a backdrop to Donna's question is, uh, how did evil come in? You know, Satan... Um, was known as Hallel before, as one of his names at least, before his fall, before he rebelled. And he was created perfect, with perfect beauty, perfect everything, but still had that free choice. And angels knew with access to God and access to knowledge that about good and evil just as that good and evil was presented to Eve in the form of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God had put there to allow free choice to play out both on humankind and on the, the angelic kind. And Satan played a part through the cash, the serpent, to have Eve deceived so that if they ate of this tree, this they could be like good and evil. And that's where sin enters into this world and with the law of not eating from that. Uh, whereas the law was not imputed with humans in the physical world before that, but in heaven, um, there was laws. Uh, and uh, the angels are obligated to those laws, whether or not they're in the earth or in their heaven or they're in Hades or if there are any other dimensions or locations that I am not familiar with. So having understood Satan was created perfect, the most unique of angels, and that he had free choice and he was understood as Halal as meaning uh, brightness and uh, also rooted in 1984, which is uh, meaning uh, to uh, have pride and be boastful and, and to shine. So Halal and Halal, um, similar words, but now you have that pride and that boastful part as well as, as the glory and the, and the shining part of his definition to his name. And so it's this brightness, this glory, and all the knowledge and the talents and the capability and the power that he had that corrupted his wisdom. So his brightness or his beauty, uh, as it's understood in Ezekiel 28, with beauty is what's going to corrupt the wisdom. And so the wisdom now becomes full of thoughts of good and evil as opposed to just doing good and he persists in that and so it's the brightness that uh, and the beauty of that brightness that cor corrupted the wisdom and that's how it came in and it's just due to free choice uh, and access to knowledge and it was interesting that satan had presented that through the nahash that if you ate this knowledge of good and evil you can be like gods elohim uh, or like god a superlative elohim but more like to be like gods as in the small case as in the pantheon to know good and evil and then to do with that as you choose at least for a period of time and so that's how evil came in there was no evil in creation it starts with Satan and it's like a virus that spreads. And one of the reasons why he's called a murderer from the beginning, because his sin creates not just murder, but all of the corruption of the physical world and stuff that's going to overlap into heaven at times, like in, in the war of angels in revelation 12. So, um, that's how that's how pride came into his heart. It was from his creation and the free will decision to do good with that or not.
Thank you very much for that one. Our next question comes from Leon. Oh, excuse me. I accidentally passed one. Our next question comes from Pete. Where do the nefarious ones, the humankind, think that they will go if, when they die, before the earth or before the end times? And or do you, they think they will themselves return? Yeah, it's a very good question because the humans and or the let's say the descendants of the Nephilim and the uh, humans that may not have any sort of genealogy back to the giants. They are the ones that um, believe in these kinds of doctrines as to what we get flooded with through entertainment, literature, media, all sorts of avenues because they control everything is that there is this reincarnation sort of doctrine that they have so and in that in sort of the lower levels um you know you have an ability to come have your soul come back and they don't talk about the spirit because this is a physical world doctrine and biblically in the new testament we're told that there's a soul a spirit and a body and the spirit comes from heaven and it merges with the soul and only God and Jesus can separate the spirit from the soul. And so when humans die, that spirit goes back to heaven and the soul and the body, that's that dwelling place, oiketarian in earth, and that that's what's going to decay. And then when we're resurrected, as a Christian perspective, we're going to receive a, a new body that can go between heaven and earth just as Jesus uh, body does and it'll be like his body that he was resurrected in so for humans the mundane they're basically they introduce this idea that if you don't do really good things on earth you're going to go back and your spirit's going to be part of nature it's going to be part of animals and they look at mundane humans as not being really able to to go higher this whole reincarnation, that's, that's sort of like they have a higher level of understanding and a lower level, and only the adepts understand the higher level, and only the adepts can affect their spirit as a counterfeit spirit that doesn't go to sleep. So what this doctrine is essentially doing at the higher level is saying that that counterfeit spirit that doesn't sleep, that's doesn't sleep that that is the disembodied spirit of the giants demons as we might better understand that is is they need to understand the mysteries and they need to be able to find their way to their heaven which is hades to be with their gods with that rule from there and they don't want to be wandering the earth and no ability to get through these portals so there's knowledge to be able to access those portals either through rituals or knowledge or math or technology however that is uh, done to be able to get into those portals and they don't want to get through the portals and not end up with their gods and go to the pit prison that we talked about so that's the knowledge reserved for the adepts and the royales to do that everything else is is a different kind of deception for the mundane just to lead them away from God and tell them over generations you might be able to um, evolve into Godhood. And so that's where you have the doctrine and entertainment where you have past lives and all sorts of things like that. And so this is a doctrine that allows them to, in their belief system, even though it's still a deception, to believe that they can be with their gods and to become gods in, in the heaven and actually have a place as recognized as for themselves as a star in the uh, second part of the universe, of the physical universe, the second heaven. And just as Osiris... Uh, and Isis, they went up to the Orion or Sirius um, constellation area that that is what the descendants of the Nephilim are striving to do. So what they believe is they're looking for godhood within the physical world. And that's what they're striving for. 
uh, and that their spirit doesn't die and we see them show up as ghosts but from a biblical perspective is is that a human spirit sleeps doesn't mean it will, it will be resurrected into immortality that's to be determined by your faith and by god and so some are will be resurrected in the resurrections that we have coming in the end time to everlasting life and those who uh, are going to go through a, a judgment to establish that uh, whether or not they get immortality or go to the lake of fire, that's the, uh, the resurrection of the dead at the end of Revelation 20. And we see this in a microcosm in Ezekiel 37 with Israel, where you have the resurrection of the end time of all of Israel, along with visible Israel, you know, who are alive today and Judah from around the world. Israel being the lost tribes, they're going to be judged, some to everlasting life and some to the second death. And that's just like a foreshadow of what will happen for all of the Gentile nations at the end of Genesis 20. Even though you have the resurrections, most of the resurrections of the saints happening before the resurrection and the reconciliation of Israel and Judah. Excellent. Thank you very much for that one. Our next question comes from Leon. How are the Nephilim the men of renown when no seed of evildoers can be renowned, according to Isaiah 14.20? And if we need to take a quick break so you can get some water, that's totally fine. I will... Uh, I'll read it real quick. Isaiah 14, 20 says, You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Well, thank you for that. I had my mic off, so it wasn't the water. <laughs> but anyways, uh, great question because some of the more important passages in the Bible, I mean, I like to use several different translations, as, as many as six at times, to get a better understanding what that passage might look like. And I also will, you know, try and take it back to Hebrew and, and to Greek, so Hebrew in this sort of case. But I also like to read passages in context as well, so not just total in isolation. How does it fit within the narrative and how does it fit with scripture throughout the Bible. So um, after Isaiah 14, 20, where it says the evildoers shall never be renowned, Isaiah 14, 21 gives some context that says, prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with the cities. So it's these ones that are renowned that aren't going to possess those lands in, in, in the future time. So when we look at um, uh, this word that says renown in Isaiah 14, 20, it's a different Hebrew word than the word renown in Genesis 6, 4. And it's 71, 21, and it's kara, Q-A-R. A, and uh, it's rooted in 71.22, Karar, which means to encounter in a hostile sort of manner. So that's the root, and it is uh, to uh, inherit and befall but to inherit the land so there's a connection to the context that follows in 21 from 20 and so the the word 71 21 the actual word that's quoted as opposed to the root that has uh impact on that word renown so it's an idea of of accosting uh and recognizing in the address so you have to combine those two words, I think, in, the, in this definition. And so, kara means proclaimed, addressed, and call out by name. And it also can mean famous and renowned, but in the sense of, its, of, of the word that is being applied, 
it's in the idea of a cost thing. So you have to take that back to the root. So it was in a hostile sort of manner. So this is a renowned as in infamy. So they will never be renowned in the sense of being famous, good, but uh, they'll be renowned as infamous. So now if we look at Genesis 6, 4, that I think Leon is referring to with the Nephilim, they were the mighty ones and the men of renown. So renown in Genesis 6, 4 comes from two words equally, uh, Shem and Shemaim. One meaning 8034, which is Shem, which is the same word for uh, the patriarch Shem, uh, means reputation, glory, famous name, and or infamous. So you have to, again, look at the application for the definition, but it's also equated with Shema, which is the singular form of the Shemaim. And you don't get Shema being used, but in this case, um, and where it says men, you'd probably use, or people, you'd probably use Shemaim anyways. And that means heaven. It also means stars. And it also stars are angels. And it means heavenly ones in the male plural, as the I am is attached on there. So in Genesis 6, 6 4, the Nephilim, are the gibberim, mighty ones, of the and the men uh, of renown, the men of reputation or infamy, the men of of reputation, the men of uh, the heavenly ones. So I think there's a larger meaning that's going on in um, Genesis six four for the translation of renown than what is going on in 1420, which is not really talking about uh, the Nephilim specifically in terms of their initial creation. Uh, these are the seed of those evildoers. And those evildoers could be strictly human and or they could be uh, from the descendants. But again, this is the inheritance of the earth that Israel is going to be uh, receiving, uh, you know, beginning with, uh, with, with the millennium and, and with the second exodus in the last three and a half years. So I think we have to be careful not to overlap that because there's two different Hebrew words is, is kind of the short answer. So, and it's not renowned as being good, but renowned as being evil in both cases and renowned in, 1420 to be uh, addressed and proclaimed in a hostile manner um, as opposed to in a, in a good manner. So I think when we have the Baconian English um, doesn't always translate to, to modern English always the way we did. And we don't know whether or not there was another motivation for them, for some of the translators to confuse some of those words together. I think they should have chosen a different word for Isaiah 1420. Um, and I would have also probably suggest a little bit different translation in Genesis 6, 4 to better reflect the meaning and the context of the passage. I have really great points again. Thank you very much for that answer. The next question comes from JT Madden. Does Gary think the infamous they are trying to have a false end times? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I think the spurious ones, the terrible ones, the evil ones, the fallen angels, Antichrist, the whole kit and caboodle of the cabal and all of their partners uh, are going to want to bring about a counterfeit in time. They counterfeit everything. And uh, if you're going to deceive the people to a level to accept Antichrist over Jesus as the true Antichrist, I mean, as the true Christ, then the deception has to be unimaginable on a scale that we can't fully understand, but we might be able to get our heads around 
what they're trying to do to create those delusions and deceptions and with the false prophets and the false signs and the contrived prophecies and all the different things that they're going to be doing, they're going to need to try and move the timetable sooner than the ordained times because they want to have a, you know as much running lane as possible. Now, they're going to accept the ordained time, but they're going to, just as the Bible tells us, have Antichrist ruling for three and a half years before Armageddon. So they're going to need a counterfeit end time. So they're going to manipulate scripture to do that. And they're going to fold it into their polytheist scriptures and beliefs and and prophecies. So they're going to create seven years that is, you know, um, a different seven years than the ordained time that Daniel 9.27 talks about of the last seven years. And they're going to create a time of end times with, with contrived catastrophes that is part of the fig tree generation, but it's on a faster or sooner scale. So if you look at Antichrist, you can define that as being before and oppose and or replacement and or usurper, all of which you can use for Antichrist definition that he's going to come before Jesus And that he did in the past come before Jesus, look for that as well, that he opposes Jesus uh, and that he is a replacement for him and the usurper of Jesus and all of his titles and all of his prophecies. So to do that, you have to recreate an end time and you have to create a counterfeit Armageddon because Jesus comes back at Armageddon. So Antichrist needs that Armageddon that I think is Revelation 9, Joel 1 and 2. And uh, also um, Ezekiel 38 and 9. I also look at that they're going to utilize some of the things that are uh, said in Revelation and end time prophecy and, and counterfeit those or manipulate those. So I think Antichrist is going to need a scenario of coming back with the clouds of heaven. Uh, all of his loyal followers, both, um, they'll be said to be different things, but we could probably expect that these are going to be the fallen angels that will be populating who's coming back with them. And we kind of see that in Daniel 8, 10 and in Revelation, um, and in Revelation 12. And, uh, and I think he's bringing all of his loyal ones with him, just as Revelation 19 does with Jesus riding a white horse. Look for a counterfeit of that of some form. And in Revelation 12, you have the war in heaven. That's where Satan and Antichrist um, are going to go into heaven and try and take over heaven. And they're going to be repelled by Michael and his angels. And then all of these stars are going to fall to the earth. And they're going to be walking amongst human. And I think that's, as Antichrist comes back, um, that's part of the intermixing with his Armageddon battle and part of the whole sort of counterfeiting of the end times. So, uh, and when we look at the, what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, 29, where the stars follows, uh, fall, stars fall from heaven, he talks about this, these are the powers that uh, are going to shake the heavens. These are the powers as in and some of the angelic orders that are shaken in heaven. So, yeah, do I think he's going to uh, recreate um, uh, uh, he and all of his followers? Are they going to try and recreate end time events? Absolutely. Do they cover them all? I don't know, but it's going to be so plausible and so incredibly unexpected for most and so real that it's going to deceive even the elect if that were possible. And that's why we know, one of the reasons why we know Jesus will save us from that time of trial, that time of temptation, that hour as it's described in Revelation. That's the same hour in Revelation 11 where the two witnesses are slain by the one who comes up out of the abyss. It's the same hour as Babylon is destroyed, and it's the same hour that 
the ten kings hand their power over to Antichrist to destroy Babylon and bring in Antichrist rule uh, over the earth. Well, thank you very much for that answer. I did see reports in the chat uh, that I had some low volume, so prayerfully everyone can hear me a little better. Right, our next question comes from Donna Smith. Do you have a teaching on why Lucifer fell? And also on Yahuwah's characteristics? Yeah, I do. I have a, a six-part series on uh, Satan. And uh, so if people want to get a hold of me, I can send that document because I deal with different aspects of it. But in parts two and three, uh, I'll deal with the anointed cherub who walked amongst the fiery altar like seraphim, and the seraphim are ministers. And also in Ezekiel 28, he has the nine jewels uh, as a priest would wear, just as the Levites uh, of the priesthood had 12 jewels in the time of Exodus. And that I think he was the high priest uh, that Jesus is going to replace as part of the Melchizedek order replacement for this void that's been there since Satan was degraded. So yeah, if people want to get a hold of me on that, I think uh, it's it's a it's a interesting understanding of how far Satan fell and how many different in the series you'll find out uh, learn about all, many of the other attributes that he has and different names that he has as well. So uh, he would have, you know, uh, attributes of a cherub. He has attributes of a seraphim. He has attributes of a morning star, uh, just as uh, he's called in, in, in Isaiah 14, uh, part of the morning star order. So he has all of these different facets, and he is part of the, the things that Jesus will be doing or what Jesus replaces as being the permanent uh, Melchizedek heading up the priesthood uh, that Seraphim, I thought that I think uh, Satan once had. Awesome. All right. We are breezing through the questions tonight. Make sure if you are joining in in the live chat, please do ask your questions there over at youtube.com slash Zen Garcia. And we will be posting those up on the list for the pre-made questions for next month. Or if we have time, which prayerfully we will, we'll ask them tonight to Brother Gary. All right. We have about five minutes before break. Our next question comes from JT Madden. What does Gary think is the two witnesses? You know, it's an absolutely fabulous question, and there's so many different theories on it, and uh, whether or not they're uh, angelic beings or they're humans, I think they're humans uh, because they die and then they're resurrected again. So uh, I sort of go to that as uh, a key sort of understanding in the end time. And then there's a number of people, who could they be? Um, you can just make this significant list, but for me, I, I like to let scripture whittle that down as much as possible. So I go to Hebrews 9.27 to sort of, how do I narrow that list down? And it says, uh, men die once and then the judgment. So we're assigned one death. And so when I look at somebody like Moses, for example, and you know, you could say he's a very good choice for the two witnesses. Uh, he did die once, and Michael was sent to retrieve him, so he would not die again, in my understanding. Um, and he may be part of the seven shepherds, though, and plus one more, just as King David is going to be raised for the second exodus uh, in the end time. And so, you know, Jehovah and King David are going to be the ones leading the exodus, so I wouldn't put Moses in there. Uh, I think the candidates that are left uh, narrow down to three from what we would be aware of biblically, maybe four. But again, I wouldn't include Lazarus as that sort of fourth one there um, because he suffered the first death. He may be still alive. I mean, who knows? Um, but uh, he certainly suffered the first death and then, then Jesus raised him up. 
And it, I guess it's a whether did he raise them into an immortal body or was he going to, to die again? But again, um, he suffered the first death. So I kind of take him off my list, even though Jesus loved him deeply. Um, and that leaves me with the disciple Jesus loved, uh, Elijah and Enoch. So Enoch, we know, went to heaven. And he would be a terrific witness uh, testifying to the veracity of the antediluvian epoch, what happened, the giants, the flood, uh, and would make a terrific witness. Uh, I also think Elijah would make a very, very good witness. And he could testify to the new covenant and to what uh, the veracity of of Israel and the veracity to what they believed in the Holy Covenant add veracity as a priest and a prophet of the Holy Covenant could testify to that. But I think he might be fitting better in with uh, the seven shepherds as well. So I'd lean to Enoch and the disciple Jesus loved, and I encourage people to go to John 21, 20 to 24 and read about that. All right, thank you. We will be right back after this short break. I love motherhood more than I could have ever imagined. One of the most important things to me is nurturing a strong foundation in Yahusha's character in our children. That said, I made sheets that went over the fruits of the Spirit, the armor of God, the Ten Commandments, and creation days. Each day at breakfast, we would go over these and then read books like Cat in the Hat that just felt so void in meaning, but they loved the rhymes. I looked everywhere for rhyming biblical principles that, and couldn't find any. That's when I decided I would make them myself. Praise God, we now have our first book, Eliana and Ezra's Journey Through the Fruits of the Spirit, a first in a series. Every morning we now can continue to build strong principles, even through rhymes, and I wanted to offer it to the babies in your life too. Please go to Sacred Root Publishing and search Fruits of the Spirit to get your copy. Or you can go to prophecyforchildren.com. Thank you so much. As a bookstore for truth seekers, it's our goal to make ancient manuscripts which were once held captive by secretive institutions available for public consideration. In our generation where wisdom has increased as Daniel the prophet foretold, we have access to many of the testimonies our early church brethren were persecuted for preserving. After being hidden for centuries, these manuscripts have been leaked from various sources throughout the earth, and it's our goal to gather these sources into printable form to make available for all who seek the ancient way. If you're looking to deepen your studies of the biblical narrative, find these ancient manuscripts and more at sacredwordpublishing.com.
your partnership with Sacred Word Publishing goes further than the publishing of ancient manuscripts and weekly video content. You also make a huge impact across the earth in orphanages in Myanmar, India, Uganda, and Kenya. Your support is crucial for the development of the Ecclesia of Real Truth Seekers. We thank you for joining us in hosting Secrets Revealed, Momentary Zen, the Digital Readers Club, Ask Me Anything series, and other shows that have helped lead so many to the truth of salvation. To become even more involved, please visit patreon.com slash sacredwordpublishing where you can partake in exclusive, interactive, patron-only content and help us continue shining the light of love in this darkened world. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the planet. Not giving up. Revolution Radio. 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 All right. Thanks for listening. While we took that short break here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. All right. Welcome back, hey, everybody. Welcome back, it's everybody. great to be with you all with again you for all. the second part of our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Gary Wayne. We've gotten through quite a few questions so far. Uh, prayerfully, we will be able to get into the questions from the live chat tonight. So if you do have a question, please do put it there in the live chat at youtube.com slash Garcia. We'll make sure to add it to the list. We'll do our best to get to it tonight. And if we do not, we will make it a priority for the pre-made list on next month's Ask Me Anything with Brother Gray. All right, so let's go ahead and welcome Brother Gray back. Are you still with us, sir? I am. All right. Welcome back. Uh, before we get back into the questions, could you let the listening audience know if they were not here for the beginning of the show, where can they get a copy of your awesome book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy and Part 2? Yes, the best way to get a hold of uh, me or by Genesis uh, 6 Conspiracy Part 1 and or Part 2 is through my website. And that's Genesis 6 with the number 6 conspiracy.com. And on the website, I have a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters for part one. And uh, I noticed today that in part two, the generous excerpt of all 84 chapters went up in uh, on the website as well. So you can get a good feel for uh, whether or not that's the right book or books for you or not. And then um, it's available to buy, buy signed copies off of the website. So if you want to sign copy, there's a Canadian page, there's a U.S. page, and then there's overseas or the rest of the world page. And uh, I do believe the, the the new book is up there as well today when I flashed through it just before the show. Um, but the Genesis 6 Part 2 is not available yet, and uh, I will be getting a notice out to people in the next two or three weeks when I nail down the exact date for uh, availability. Um, but and and the, how you will be able to get a hold of the book. So uh, if people were to want to purchase today, they actually could buy both. I just can't deliver that book, and I, I don't have an exact time on that. We talked about the first part of the show. Um, it's in the publishing queue, but there's issues in terms of the labor and printers and paper right now. So it's not going to be right away. We're just waiting to get a, a time on that. And if you want to get a hold of me, you could, uh, and I think I saw on the new site, there's a contact the author icon. Uh, and if, if it's it's up or down as it's being worked on, go to the second page or the media page where it says contact Gary Wayne for interview. That's my email address, genesis6conspiracy at gmail.com. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Off the website as well for this book and the next book, um, you can click over and get the Kindle edition and or over to amazon.com over to amazon.ca and, and barnesandnoble.com 
And I will also have bundle pricing. Uh, if you want to buy multiple books, one of each or more than uh, two, I'll have a few different uh, bundled prices if you're, if you're looking to buy more than one copy. Awesome. I definitely encourage everyone to check out that treasure trove of information. Now the two part treasure trove. Really excited to hear that part two is done. Brother Gary, congratulations on all of your hard work coming to fruition. And uh, one question, was there a plan for a new book for a new series as well? <laughs> for a third book? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm already into one book for 300 pages that I'm going to go back and rework. I, I don't have a timetable uh, for that. I'm still focused on getting the second book out, promoting that. And I have other books I would write in behind because there's things that still didn't get into the second book that uh, I would... I would think would make a, a shorter book, but a very interesting book and sort of finish off a lot of concepts as well. And then uh, the publisher has uh, is wanting me to do a Reader's Digest version of both books so that, uh, and he wants it to be about 150 pages. So I'm considering that. And then that if people wanted to uh, get more of the details, then you could go get either one of the books, whichever ones are both. So. Uh, all of those are being sort of talked about. Uh, I'll see what sort of priority it gets into. I think I want to finish uh, um, the book I'm, I, I've I set aside for a couple of years and get, get that one done, but we'll see what happens. You know, you've definitely earned yourself a little breather, a little break here. And I know all the effort that goes into putting books together and, and how exciting it is that you're at this part where the audience is getting ready to be able to read it and give feedback and uh, learn from it and be blessed by it. And uh, what a great opportunity it is for us to be able to receive that, uh, the fruits of your labor. So thank you very much for all those efforts. And of course, all praise to the Most High who has guided you in your research. So let's go ahead and jump back over to the questions. This next one comes from Holly Engel. What are the absolutely clear faces in the clouds? Who and or what and or where are these entities? Yeah, interesting question for sure. So, and, uh, you know, some of the images that you can see in, in clouds are, you know, absolutely sometimes crystal clear. Um, so one wonders whether or not that can be done as a natural phenomena or not. Um, a lot of the so-called uh, secular uh, wizards of psychiatry uh, would say it's all imagination and there's even a term that uh, i think is used in there for people who see things in clouds called paradelia but uh, i don't think that these are faces of god as uh, you know some traditions in uh, um, and Catholicism uh, indicate and or of angels, uh, even though you get this sort of passage that's kind of interesting that some will fall back on. It's called the, you know, from Exodus 40, uh, verse 35, there's a cloud of glory that covered Israel. So, and then you, and you have, you know, like Jesus coming back on the clouds of heaven with his army and you get these imageries that these could be sort of angelic beings or not. But the problem is, is if you put a face of God or a face of uh, Jesus up there or a face of an angel, then humans will probably uh, worship the angels and uh, you're not to make an image of 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 anything to 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 worship uh, just. You, you know, even Israel, I mean, they, they didn't even decorate the stones uh, on, on their altars or their steps. So uh, it wouldn't be something that's coming from God. It would be either one of two things, then. It would be natural, uh, which is really interesting uh, how that would happen. But I guess in the permutations, anything is possible. Um, or it could be demons uh, or fallen angels that are 
forming those types of things. And again, to try and lead people away from God or get people to pay too much attention to them and even maybe even start worshiping them. Um, and or they could be uh, setting the stage for deceptions with these images in the clouds for the end time. Because again, we, we can't really imagine all the things that they're going to do to deceive us. But what we do know, just as when angels appear before uh, humans, as in Daniel or other passages, uh, the temptation is to bow down and worship these shining opalescent beings, but they're, they will clearly tell you not to do that, and only God is to be worshipped. So... Um, we want, I think we want to be careful with where that can lead us. Um, I don't know exactly what's causing it. I think it's probably more than just natural formations. I just haven't really sort of pieced together what the whole plan would be to make these very clear faces as the question asked. A really interesting question for sure. Thank you for that answer. Next question comes from Mike Giver Levant. Who was Cain afraid of to receive a mark of protection? It is an excellent question. And I think that too many people don't ask enough of the hard questions, but I'm a contrarian. And so that would be my natural sort of position. Uh, but I think we should be asking hard questions and we should be able to answer these questions within scripture. And so, you know, the standard dogma is that Cain was afraid of people that would come from the daughters and other sons of Adam. But there was nobody in the, as you understand, the standard dogma of Christianity when there was just Cain left because Abel was killed and that only leaves Adam and Eve. And so why would he need a mark? And what we understand from the Bible, you know, as the chronology lays out, there's the Nephilim aren't there. They're not created till Genesis 6. Uh, although some people would say that there was giants that were created fr from Satan and Eve in in Genesis 3:15, I don't tend to I, I don't say that that's not possible. I just don't can't make that case myself biblically. And again, I have a great series on that whole thing. If if people want to walk through the language in both Hebrew and Greek on all the references that people use for and against. Um, and then you can decide for yourself on that. But it's not going to be the, the hash race either, the serpent race, uh, which are, uh, you know, beings of the field. They're beasts. They're created before day six, before humans are created. Because they have been degraded to serpent-like status, to what we understand them today, but they were walking, talking, intelligent uh, individuals that are connected back in the etymology of the name of Nahash back to necromancers and sorcerers and wizards. So they were already part of the religious aspect of Satan and the fallen angels. And we have no idea how many there were, but we do get that account. So maybe, you know, I wouldn't even say then based on in Genesis 3 um, that uh, Cain would be afraid of them because they're gone by the time um, Cain is born. So can't be them. And in Genesis 4, Cain built a city. And a city for who? Uh, and he has a son named Enoch, and he gets a wife. We don't know where the wife comes from, from the story as we understand it. And that uh, this is a city that goes back, city goes back to Hebrew, to the word Ayir, which is the understood as a, a place that has guarded high walls. And it's a city where many people would live. So why would he build this city? That implies there are people 
and implies from his wife that he found somebody. Um, and so that word Iir is it means it's a place of watch, uh, a place where you would have people watching so that the enemies don't attack attack you. It's also the same word and rooted in, into the word watcher that shows up in Daniel 4. So for me, the only way that any of that sort of makes any sense is, is that there's two different creations, uh, one in day six for humans, and, and then the other in the Eden account. Because again, the accounts, as I've talked about, and I got great documents on this if people want to get a hold of me on it, um, is so different and in a different order in the Eden account than in the day six account. They can't be the same story as standard dogma would, would indicate. And that Adam, I think, is created for a special commission. Uh, so that's the only way you can sort of reconcile that is that uh, these are the people from day six that Cain moves from wherever Eden is, which I think is close to the land of the covenant and below Mount Hermon, and goes east of Eden into Nod. And the city Nod is already a place. So and then he builds a city in this place called Nod. So I think all of the in, in all of the evidence that we get through scripture would indicate there were other beings before um adam and eve well that's a uh, definitely one of those good questions that i think most people ask when they first get woken up and start reading through genesis that's that's one of those good ones so thank you so much for elaborating on that move on to the next question it comes from gina do you think we will all be called up, or do you think the Lord needs people here? Yeah, I think there'll be people that are still here. Um, you know, I don't think God needs to have to have people here because he just speaks through his word and he can create just like Adam and the people of day six were created. But biblically, I think it makes sense that there are going to be people here after the Armageddon battle to populate the millennium. And certainly two groups we know of for sure, which are Israel and Judah, who are going through second Exodus and their judgment and will have their resurrection process, as Ezekiel 37 talks about. Uh, and they're going to be led by Jehovah, as Micah 5.2 and uh, and uh, five five talk about with the with the shepherds that I talked about earlier in the show, and just as Ezekiel thirty seven has David and Jehovah um, leading the way, and this is the same time frame as uh, talked about in Daniel twelve, where people are being resurrected to everlasting life, and some to um, uh, to to suffer the second death. Essentially, that is fits right in in the time of trouble or Jacob's trouble of uh, of of Daniel 12 and Jacob's trouble of, of Jeremiah 37, which is talking about the second exodus again, and Jehovah being the Jehovah of the Elohim, which is the word of God or Jesus that's going to be leading that exodus along with King David. So there will also be, I think, Gentiles that are going to survive. So we do know that not all saints are resurrected or raptured, uh, I guess is, is what I, at the time of the resurrection, not all the saints still here are raptured. Some will have to earn their stripes through fire, just as what happens with uh, Israel in the last three and a half years. And as Daniel 12 talks about, it's like a baptism by fire. So they're, they're going to be the ones who do not take the mark of the beast, who do not worship Satan, who do not worship Antichrist, and who are not slain. And they're going to populate the earth, and there may not be a ton, it's going to be like a few, just like you had eight on the ark, and just as you had, uh, you know, only a few coming out of Sodom. Um, so it's kind of like that for, for, the, for the Gentiles, I think, but there, you know, probably be more than eight, but 
Um, there's going to be a few that will survive in to populate uh, the millennium. And we know this by inference from Revelation 20, where you have Satan that's going to be released at the end of the millennium from the abyss. And what he does is he goes and he raises an army to march on Jerusalem and to try and have war. And, of course, that's defeated as quickly as what happens at Armageddon. And these are Gog and Magog, the descendants of the nations of Gog and Magog. And this infers that these are Gentile nations and, and maybe more than Gog and Magog, but certainly from Gog and Magog, people are going to survive uh, and are going to be the ones that rebel with Satan. And if there's Gog and Magog nations, there may be more Gentile nations with survivors. So I think there's an inference there that there's going to be more than just Israel and Judah who will populate the millennium based on you know, the prophecy in, in Revelation 20. So, yeah, I think uh, it's not that the Lord needs people uh, because he can create instantaneously if he wanted just to create more, but I think he wants it as part of this ongoing chapter at, that the millennium does in comparison to the last 6,000 years, and then at the end you still have a lesson for humans to learn that just as angels rebelled, even though they are intimate with God, so will humans rebel, even though they are intimate with God. And uh, it's just a way to sort of close off that sort of loose ends. And so our path to being with angels and God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit is to be resurrected and to be created immortal, to be like angels, even though we have human fathers, but something distinctly different uh, as a different being, separate than angels. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Next question comes from Jeremy Burroughs. Is the third temple a physical temple that needs to be built or is it the temple of the body? Well, I think you can make an allegorical argument that it would be a temple of the body because we're told our body's like a temple. Um, but we're, we understand when it's talking about that in, in the reference of the body as the temple as being sort of an, a, an allegorical thing. It's a, a dwelling place for our spirit that comes from heaven. Um, so when we look at prophecy, though, uh, it's talking more than an internal body. I think that uh, this temple may affect that has abomination. It may affect a lot of people who let that abomination into their temple, their body, in the last three and a half years. Um, but I don't think that that's what it's being talked about in prophecy. So in Daniel 9, 27, where it says there's going to be seven years reserved for all vision and prophecy and things to be fulfilled, including the coming of, of the Messiah and Jesus, um, that you have an abomination at the middle of the seven years where the daily sacrifice will stop. So that implies that that sacrifice will begin at the beginning of the last seven years and then end at the three and a half year point, even though Antichrist permits it within the covenant that he's going to negotiate, he's going to stop it when he becomes crowned in the temple as 2 Thessalonians uh, talks about, where he sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. So there's a physical temple there. And in Daniel 9, 27, and also the abomination is talked about, you know, in Daniel 11, Daniel 12, and elsewhere in Daniel. And Jesus himself in the Gospels in Matthew 24, 15, 20, to be specific, directs, the reader to understand the prophecies of Daniel as to the abomination that is talked about. And when Judea is going to be fleeing, because Antichrist is going to come to power at the midpoint of the last seven years, it starts to make sense. Just as Revelation 13 talks about Antichrist's reign uh, is three and a half years. It's the last three and a half years once he comes to power. And so 
you have in Daniel 9, 27, it says on an overspreading of the temple is where the daily sacrifice is going to take place. And that means or could be translated as an extremity of the temple or a wing of the temple. And so that implies a physical temple where the sacrifice is going to go on just as it did in the past with Israel and specifically with Judah uh, in Jerusalem. Judah as being the southern kingdom controlling Jerusalem after David had captured it, uh, where they did, they built the temple, built the Holy of Holies, and did the daily sacrifices. This will begin again, but only for the first three and a half years when it ends at the midpoint. And so if you look at the directions in the book of Josephus, he places the temple and the Holy of Holies a little bit further to the edge of where uh, of where the current mosque is today that Islam holds. So it could be a wing built in that direction or a branch wing uh, that they'll be able to do that's closer to the valley, um, as Josephus describes it, where they're going to be doing the daily sacrifice. But understand Israel and Judah uh, would understand where the Holy of Holies would be be and one would expect that they'll sacrifice where they think the holy of holies is which is not quite at the temple but at the same time if you don't have a universal religion this can't happen because there's no way the the current islamic rule would permit judah to get anywhere near the temple and begin their sacrifices so yes i think there'll be uh, an extension built on the current temple, or there might be even another one, but it all happens so quickly as you get closer to the end that I think it has to be uh, an extension onto the temple. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see that play out. Thank you very much for the insight. Next question is pretty similar to one from earlier. Mike Kyber Labonte asked, where did Cain's wife come from? Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a very good question for sure. And um, as we talked about before, I think his wife comes from the people of day six. Um, but if there was a, another seed line that was created after Genesis three, as in Genesis three fifteen, which I'm okay with, I just for me I can't get there sort of scripturally without ending too much of scripture, scripture, and I don't like to do that. I'm thinking more likely from the people of day six. Um, some people might also say that Cain took a female uh, angel as well, uh, one that took a female form and created his lineage from there at that point in time. That's possible as, as, as well. We don't get scripture for that. We just say that it's a wife. And there's no indication that it is uh, of a preternatural uh, scenario. So one presumes it is human of some form, just as Adam is the same word that is used for men, going back to Hebrew in, in Genesis 1. So I think day six is more likely. If we look at now the lineage uh, that are, is provided, the genealogies that are provided, uh, we understand that in Genesis 5, uh, you have uh, the genealogy, Genesis 3, 3 to 5, of Adam at 130 years old is going to have a son named Seth. And then at some time even later than that, Adam and Eve beget other sons and daughters. So that's the only place from the Adamite lineage or the uh, yeah, the Adamite lineage that he could get a, a daughter of uh, from uh, from Adam and Eve. So some people say that he would have, you know, ma possibly married his sister. That, but that doesn't make any sense because it's just too far down the road. Um, so when I kind of look at that, I look at uh, the story of Genesis three and the sacrifices. And this, I think, happens very early in the life of Abel and Cain. And they're both offering 
their first offerings to God in adulthood that, you know, Adam would have carried on before and taught Adam and Abel to do this. But Abel gives his first fruits as you're instructed to do as reflected in Israelite law. And so Cain did not. He gave a sacrifice, but it doesn't say first fruits. And so I think that's why it was rejected. And that would have happened right at the beginning uh, of, because that's the first time you have an offering by Cain and Abel to God. So by inference and deduction, that would be as soon as they were considered adults and probably their first offerings of produce and things that they produced on their own as adults. So he's ostracized, Cain is ostracized immediately thereafter from Adam and Eve. And then even if Cain is 40 or 50, Adam doesn't have a son until he's 130. And we're not told Adam and Eve are in Eden for, you know, a generation. Uh, we're not told that. And so we don't know how long Adam and Eve are in there, but one presumes it's not that long period of time. So but let's say it's 20 years and then Cain is 20. It's still only 40 years. And if you think Cain wouldn't have done his first offerings by the time he's 60, you're still nowhere close to 130 uh, for years that are elapsed. So uh, I think that uh, we know that Adam had more sons and daughters. And in Deuteronomy 32, what's interesting, it even names 70 sons of Adam as patriarchs for the 70 nations before the flood, just as there are 70 nations after the flood. So we know that Adam had multiple sons and daughters that are not not named, but uh, we don't see, I don't see a chronology as to how that lines up with who Adam takes for a wife. So you're down to uh, some very small choices. Um, you have a choice of day six, that I think, which is completely different creation than, than uh, uh, Genesis 2. You have the idea that it could be a serpent seed, um, but not through the seed of the Nahash. It would probably be through the seed of Satan to make that happen or fallen angels to make that happen. And or you have something that's non-human completely and non-angelic completely, which I don't really look at that third option at all. So one of the two, I look at it's more fits better with the language that it's human. And I, I, I kind of think day six people. Really great points. Much. For that one, the next question comes from Shay Cheney. Is Azazel the angel of death? Well, he's, I think he's the destroyer. He's the, uh, the one that, you know, is attributed in the book of Enoch for all the sins of the antediluvian world, even though there are others. And he was the leader of the watchers uh, sent to the abyss or pit prison in the book of Enoch. And the leader of that in the New Testament is called Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek, which means, which means destroyer. And we actually do get Azazel as a possible candidate and a name as a second goat that's sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. The first goat is sacrificed for the sins of Israel. We're not told what the scapegoat, the second goat, is sacrificed for, but scapegoat if you're looking at the King James Version Bible and a couple other ones, uh, it will say, uh, it, will, it will go back to the Hebrew word that w is known as Azazel. And so I think he's being a sacrifice, that lamb or that goat, I'm sorry, he's being sacrificed for the sins of the antediluvian world who Azazel was ac held accountable for. And that, uh, but that doesn't make him all of that doesn't make him the angel of death. He, he causes death. Biblically, the only th thing that we get close to, to the angel of death comes in uh, Revelation 6, 8 with the rider of the pale horse. And I think, uh, and, and in the new book, I'll, I'll lay the case out for you here that I think that the, the spirit is an angel that comes from 
before the throne, just as I think these are the same riders, which are the riders in, in Zacharias 6, uh, ride chariots out throughout the world. And they are a spirit or a ruach uh, in, in Hebrew, as they're described in, in the book of Zechariah. And that um, these could be one of four archangels that uh, perhaps lead the four sides of the angelic order around the throne, of which Michael would be part of them. And a lot of people think Michael might be the angel of death. And you get this uh, angel of the Lord that, that shows up in um, the book of Joshua uh, at, you know, at the time of the Exodus uh, in, uh, in Joshua 5.13. Uh, and he's going to be talking, he's talking to Joshua at the time that he's about to start off on the uh, conquest of the, of the covenant land. And he's got this great sword. And so a lot of people think that's Michael, except that this angel of the Lord doesn't say it's Michael. Angel of the Lord would be the angel of Jehovah. Uh, so Jehovah of the Elohim. And Joshua is, you know, worshiping and uh, kneeling before this angel of the Lord. So it's not an angel because he, an angel or, would instruct him not to do that. We also have, you know, this angel of the Lord in, in the book of Exodus 32 that is going to bring death on the people of Egypt. And so again, that's angel of the Lord. That seems to be Jehovah who's doing that. And then you have the angel of the Lord who comes and destroys the Assyrian army in Isaiah 37. And the angel of the Lord, and again, uh, I think this is, uh, you know, the word Jehovah Jesus or the preexistent Jesus as it's being talked about is he's being referenced in, in the Old Testament. So, it, you know, life comes through Jesus and the word. Uh, so you could flip that around if you are not a believer in God and Jesus, he could be viewed as the angel of death because he's the one who through him you you will have life if you don't go through him you won't have life so you could make you know a sort of a flip around argument that um he would be um the the angel of death if there is one but then that doesn't account for this rider that's riding the pale horse now that one might be michael as one of the four winds of prophecy that i referenced uh, and a few minutes ago, and not Jesus, uh, who would be riding that horse. There's a, it's a big topic, but there's also a concept in Islam of Azrael, uh, A-Z-R-A-E-L, as the angel of fate or the angel of death, and thought to be one of the four archangels. Um, and uh, even has the ability in this account, which gets overextended pretty quickly has the ability to separate the soul from the body which seems to be a corruption of in islam of separating the spirit from the soul and the body so but that is talking about an archangel it's not talking about the word or jesus in 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 the quran and i don't i didn't find this in the quran this is more of coming from from the hadith as as, as i recall but what's interesting about that Azrael, if you go, you can actually find uh, A-Z-A-R that that would be rooted in because that's a Hebrew word and it means angel of fate, uh, which is interesting. And that's actually shows up in the Bible and one who helps. So those words are, you know, 69, uh, 65 um, means to arise as well that it's rooted in. Uh, so you can take that back somewhat biblically um, to 5228, which is, which is Azar, as, as I said, as some other uh, Ezar with an E as a transliteration. But uh, the angel of death doesn't really have a uh, translation in the King James Version Bible. So you have to 
put that over as to who you think it is and in which verse. So um, I think that Azazel is not the angel of death. He causes death. Uh, he is probably more accurately called the destroyer. Thank you for all of that great information. That brings us to the end of that pre-made list of 14 questions. So we'll move into some of the live questions. Please do, if you are joining, over on youtube.com slash Lynn Garcia in the live stream chat. Please do add your questions there. Uh, we have 16 questions uh, to answer now. So if we don't get through all of them, we will roll those over to next month's pre-made list for our next Ask Me Anything with Brother Gary. All right, this question comes from R.S. and Nickel Bine. Are there any accounts of dragons in the Bible to be benevolent or in the extra-biblical texts? A really good question. Um, let's go back to the word dragon, and, you know, that's Hebrew, tanim, um, draconta in the, in the New Testament from Greek. In ancient ology, a dragon and a serpent were regarded as the same. And so you have these serpent beings uh, that the Nahash are related to as the serpent. And as they would have been likely serpentine type of beings and followers of the fallen angels and maybe even preferred and maybe even created by them uh, before day six. And so we don't get any accounts of them being um, benevolent to, to humans. Um, you also get Leviathan in the Bible that is described as a dragon in the King James Version. And uh, there was a male and a female, and the female had to be killed. And actually, God kills the uh, the female because otherwise that would be sort of destroying of the earth. It would just be um, too much for the earth the earth to handle. Or maybe that's uh, an allegory that they would have destroyed the world. Uh, so nothing there between Satan or the female that would indicate uh, doing good for uh for humans, certainly. So you also have a dragon that Satan is called that connects into the seraphim understanding of Isaiah 6, which are six-winged, serpent-faced, angelic dragons. So you have this angelic being that are the seraphim, some who rebelled, some who did not. And the seraphim are thought to be um, the watchers of Genesis 6 uh, in the beginning who created giants who looked just like them. And then again, after the flood, there were also other watchers that uh, did this. So you would have had ones that would also look like the cherubim. But cherubim are also kind of thought of as, as dragons as well in some, some accounts. So in Daniel 4, you have these watchers who come from heaven and they're dealing with the governance of the earth. And that's one of the functions that the seraphim are responsible for. They're responsible for the, the government and for the religious aspects and the pillars and all the angels that rep, are represented below them in the angelic hierarchy. And that the seraphim work before the altar of God in the fiery stones. And one of them uh, goes up to Isaiah in Isaiah 6 and takes a stone from the altar and takes away the sins of Isaiah so that he can complete the vision uh, with God. And so they are ministers before heaven. So you have good seraphim dragons and you have rebellious ones. So I would say in that aspect, there are some good dragons as in good loyal seraphim um, as witnessed in Isaiah 6. Uh, other than that, I don't know of any snakes on the ground or reptilian type of beings that are benevolent to humankind. And unless the uh, fallen angel saves some of them, the hash, then um, none of them would be. But I think if they were saved by the Nahash, uh, as in off the world, in the world, another dimension, and some didn't lose their arms and legs and intelligence, they would be loyal to their uh, saviors. So I would say, no, there wouldn't be any uh, bene benevolent dragons. Now, you can get benevolent dragons in polytheism, just as you've got 
black magic and white magic, just as you have evil witches and good witches, and just as you have this dual uh, good versus evil in perpetuity, that some of these would be looking after the betterment of good of, of, of humankind, just as you have the visible ones on earth wearing white hats and black hats, the black hats. Uh, don't want anything to do with humans. They want them destroyed. And supposedly some of the white hats want us to want to look after humans, but they worship the same pantheon of gods. And no matter what, the destination is the same. Having it played out in their favor, they would wipe us from memory, wipe us from the face of the earth, just as they tried to do with Israel. So, no, I don't think so. Very fascinating. Subject. Thank you very much for that info. Next question comes from Yahuhanan Bell. Can you see in the case of Noah's curse of Canaan, of course, not ham is the garments? Hmm. I'm not exactly sure. I'll try to read it again. Can you see in the case of <laughs> Noah's curse on Canaan, of course, not ham is the garments? I don't, I don't know if I can make sense. Do you want to? Well, I, I think the what's being implied there, and I'm, if, if I understand the question, the question properly, so hopefully we can answer it for uh, you, Yohukanen, was it? And I think what is being asked or, or, or sort of said within the question that the garments are ham. So in when Ham is uh, violating Noah or Noah's wife, as some people believe, is that when it says that uh, Ham uh, saw the nakedness of his father uh, and he uncovered uh, Noah, that it was Canaan that was on Noah and he's the close, and he's violating in a homosexual way of Noah. Um, so at this point in time, if that's the question, so I'll answer it based on that premise. Um, at that time, uh, they're still on Mount Ararat, and the curse that Canaan receives um, is based on uh, naming that mountain as being Ararat. So Arar is the Hebrew word for curse, and Ararat is the mountain that they're on. So it's the mountain of the curse. And we know that, that, that they're on the mountain because there's no other people listed other than the eight at this point in time. So this is shortly after landing at Ararat and Noah is just starting to uh, plant some crops and things and obviously some vines uh, because he becomes drunk. So we don't get any lineages of Canaan until Genesis 10. And my understanding of the Bible is it's chronological and that uh, unless there's a reference of let's say let's say the book of uh, of the prophets, any one you pick, it's going to give you reference and where it goes back to fit in 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 the chronology of the Bible, and then in this case into like you know First and Second Chronicles and into First uh, and Second Kings. So you'll get those references. But at this point in time, we we don't have the offspring that are listed, and this is much like. Genesis 3.15. This is a curse just as the Nahash was cursed. This is a prophecy that will happen through the seed of the, uh, of the serpent, as is talked about in Genesis 3.15. And also, this is a curse that's going to happen through the seed or the, the, the offspring of Ham. And Canaan, I understand how it can be inferred that he would be the clothing as being in there, but that's not exactly what the, what the text says. And in what it says in, in Genesis 9, starting in 21, it says, you know, he was uncovered within his tent. So it's either him or his wife. But typically, 
uh, if it, the one that is going to be uncovered is named. So it'll be like his sister or his wife that will be uncovered, but Noah would receive the shame as you look at that in, in the laws. And then in Genesis 9.22, it says that Ham, the father of Canaan, um, saw the nakedness of his father. And this is implying that Canaan is going to receive that curse as that prophetic uh, curse that's to be carried out. Um, but it's Ham who sees the nakedness of the father, not Canaan. And then it says, curse it be Canaan to be servants of those, of those uh, will be unto his, so it'd be servants of his, of his brothers or uh, descendants down the road. So that, again, part of the prophecy. And what, what it also says in the passage is, is that Noah in 924, it says Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son not grandson, his son had done unto him. So he knew what had happened to him. So no, I don't think it's Canaan. He's not born yet, but this is the same type of curse wrapped into a prophecy as in Genesis 3, and it will be played out through the descendants of Ham. And in this case, uh, Canaan, and not all of the sons, so that not all of the seed would be cursed. That's how that's how I would understand that if that's what was being asked. Well, thank you for interpreting the question and answering it. Go on to the next one. We have about six minutes left, so maybe this will be the last one, depending on how long it takes. This one comes from Al Hoff. Isn't Lucifer the son of Satan, Halel bin Shahar? No, uh, for for the first thing, Lucifer is translated from Halel, and it's Halel ben Shakar, yes, but that means Halel, son of the morning. And Halel, um, he fell from heaven, as Isaiah 14 sort of rolls out into this, and that the word fell is nafel. As in the, and would be part of the Nephilim and from heaven to Shamaim. So when you look at the fallen ones, that's Nephilim. Uh, the, from the heavenly ones, that's the Shamaim. And the whole language here is talking specifically about one key angel that fell from heaven, and he is the son of the morning. It's not that he is... Uh, the morning star. He is what part of the morning star orders, and we get that morning star order that is listed in Genesis or in Job 38, 4 through 7. And what's also people need to understand is, is just because Lucifer is connected to Venus doesn't mean that that's what we should be calling him. That's what the Masons call him. And you have an Italian word inserted into the English language for a Hebrew word. And Venus, you know, it's a Latin word, but Venus is a morning star and an evening star. And so in Greek mythology, those gods were actually split up into two different uh, uh, gods, uh, Hesperus and Phosphorus, as, uh, or Eosphorus, as I should say. And so, um, no, I don't think that Lucifer is the son of Satan because that word Lucifer is Halel, and it doesn't say Lucifer, son of Satan, because Shakar is mourning. And there, there's, it's just, just a, I think it's a corruption of the verse. Now, I, I know a lot of people will disagree with me on that. Um, and I don't think it's Hellel, uh, which is an allegory for Babylon. Uh, and that's H-E-L-E-L. -E uh, and we never get Hellel used as a Hebrew word in the Old Testament. We only get Hellel and it's only used once. So the king of Babylon is this antichrist figure that's part of that dual prophecy so again you got to look at the whole whole context the verses uh immediately before and immediately after and also how it fits with the rest of the bible so in luke uh in the book of luke uh, jesus is describing um satan who he saw fall from lightning 
fall from heaven like lightning. And he specifically labels that Satan as the one who fell. And that's Hillel, son of the morning. Thank you so much, Brother Gary, on behalf of everyone in the chat. Thank you so much for giving us these past two hours and for answering and entertaining all of our thoughts and ideas. It's been a real pleasure to have you on again. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. Could you please let us know uh, one more time where we could grab a copy of your awesome book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, as well as a part two? The best place to get a copy is to go to my website. And on the website, there is a buy page, whether or not you are in Canada, in the U.S., or somewhere else in the world. There's three pages, and both books uh, are available through that website. Uh, and that's how you get a signed copy is go to the buy page. From the buy page, you can also link over to barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, amazon.ca, and also over to the Kindle edition and both books will be available in the Kindle edition and both books will be sold through all the same avenues as uh, book one does. So, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I just noticed today that uh, uh, the person working on my website has a generous excerpt of all 84 chapters of the new book up there if you want to give it a quick look. Excellent. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Brother Gary, again. And Shalom. Have a great night. God bless.